Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, today we're very lucky because we're going to have a couple of interviews, uh, particularly with two of our great experts uh, in neuro, uh, neurologic diseases. Uh, Dr. Ben Deneen in neuroscience and Dr. Ganesh Rao in neurosurgery. They're both working on uh, brain tumors, but particularly glioblastoma, which has been absolutely one of the most difficult tumors uh, to address. There's been almost no advances made, but our people are making advances. And so Dr. Deneen's lab has been working with uh, potential new therapies that look very promising. And Dr. Rao is, is actually the neurosurgeon who's been working with them to try and effectuate uh, benefits to patients. So first I got to talk to Dr. Deneen and then we'll talk to Dr. Rao and this should be really exciting news on glioblastoma. Well, we're very lucky today to have Dr. Deneen who is one of our outstanding neuroscientists. is going to explain all things to my sister about how the brain works how and, and what can go wrong. And so thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Very excited. So first of all, yeah, because this is, I'm directing this totally to my sister. She has a friend who had brain cancer and said, you got to explain this to me. And I said, okay, I'll do that. So first of all, like how, how many cells are in the brain and what kind of cells are there? Billions of cells, billions, billions of billions of cells. Everyone's heard of neurons, which are the most, the most prominent cell in the brain, but there's other cells than besides neurons. There's these cells called glial cells. There's blood vessels. There's immune cells. It's a very diverse Popu diverse set of cells that reside in the brain. The analogy that I like to, that I like to, that I, that I like to give is imagine the brain is a football stadium mm -hmm. and the players are the neurons. That's where all the action is. Everyone's there to see the players, but everything else in that stadium is a glial cell or a vascular cell. The field, the coaches, the goalposts, the jumbotron and the stands and everything. If you don't, so if you don't have the stadium, you don't have the game. If you don't have the players, you don't have the game. I got it. So the, so the Eagles are a brain tumor that needs to be removed. That is exactly <laughs> right. That is exactly correct. Okay, I'm just, just checking. As a Giants fan, I cannot stand any Eagles fan, but that's okay. Separate issue. So how does, how does one cell, you know, start off as small, you know, organism developing. Yes. How does one cell differentiate from another cell? How, do, how does one become a supporting cell, mm. supporting actor, how do you call it, a coach? Yes. Versus a player. player. Exactly. So we have these things called stem cells early in development. And what happens is these stem cells go through a series of differentiative steps. Mm -hmm. What happens is initially a stem cell, a neural stem cell, will make a neuron. And the neurons will begin to migrate out into their final destinations. That stem cell will then go, undergo an asymmetric division and will make a bunch of glial cells. So it's neurogenesis first and then gliogenesis. And once so asymmetric in that it's not one to two? It's exactly. one to so, many? So one to many, exactly. So then these glial, so the neurons will migrate out, the glial cells will follow them and then provide the support that they need to wire up and generate all the circuits that result in our behaviors. And so what causes the circuits to develop? How do you, how do those develop? Uh, so neurons talk to each other, obviously. There's a lot of proximity. Mm -hmm. Neurons next to each other make synaptic connections. Mm -hmm. And during that process, what happens is these other support cells, these oligodendrocytes, these astrocytes, these microglia, they come in and they sort of refine and sculpt that process. So you have blunt interactions, and those interactions are refined by these support cells. So what do the astrocytes do? Ah, that's the most interesting <laughs> cell of all. The astrocyte is, in my mind, the most interesting cell, and it's a bit of a Swiss army knife in the brain. It does a little bit of everything. It provides metabolic support for neurons, it helps them make synapses, it sucks up neurotransmitters, it releases neuroactive compounds, it interacts with blood vessels, it talks to microglia. Like the infrastructure of the brain almost. It's, it's very much the hub of everything. Yeah. It touches a little bit of everything and that's what makes them so cool but also what makes them really hard to study because they yes. do everything. And do they uh, develop tumors themselves? Yes. So so there's there's a, a wide range of brain tumors. Mm -hmm. One subtype is, is an astrocytoma which is thought to be derived or made up of cells that resemble astrocytes. I see. And you'll hear sometimes that it's a malignant tumor versus yes. a non-malignant but it's always bad in the brain, it seems like. So yeah. can you help us understand the difference between what's a malignant and non-malignant? Sure, sure. So, br so brain tumors are obviously really bad and they come in two general flavors. There's these low grade brain, brain tumors that have a certain set of mutations that we know. One, they would be I mutant for this gene, IDH. Oh. Then and these are relatively slow growing. There have been relatively benign, you can mm -hmm. take them out, and patients do relatively well. I see. IDH wild type is glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. 
that is a universally lethal tumor. You, if you get that tumor, basically survival is around 15 months. Um, it is really, really a horrific disease. Yeah, and I know many people who've had relatives or friends with yes. glioblastoma, and it's, as you say, uh, it's a death sentence. It's is terrible. there any advances in, in treating glioblastoma? Sadly, no. Um, standard of care hasn't changed in 20 years, and uh, survival rates haven't changed in 60. So there's a dire need to find new therapies. And are we doing anything about that? Funny you should ask. Oh, uh, the good thing. <laughs> in fact, we are. So what are we doing? So, the, uh, so what we're doing it sort of stems from, it's a classic bench to bedside story that started here at the Baylor College of Medicine. So about five or six years ago, we entered this field of cancer neuroscience where we study how neurons talk to brain tumors. And over the course of these studies, we found a series of targets that are expressed in glioblastoma cells that are important for rewiring the neurons to create these hyperactive states mm -hmm. that exist in brain patients with brain tumors. It just so happens that one of these targets, there is a CAR T cell that has been oh, developed yeah. to one of these targets. And this CAR T cell was developed at the Center for Cell and Gene Therapy, which is my home department. That is for, well, and Carl June won the last good award for CAR Absolutely. work he was done here at Baylor College of Medicine. Yes, so it's a great thing. So this CAR T cell recently mm -hmm. was tested in pediatric solid tumors. Mm -hmm. and it was shown to shrink pediatric solid tumors. So you, you put one and one, one and one together mm -hmm. equals two. Basically, the CAR T cell exists. We know that this antigen is highly expressed in brain tumors and that it works. And so now we're in collaboration with Dr. Rao. Well, I'm not doing anything. Dr. Rao has set up the clinical trial. I think he's uh, doing a patient today. He's doing one right now. Right now we're actually going to do an electrophysiological experiment on that tumor. So it's kind now, of cool. And, and when, you, when you develop a CAR T cell so yes. for this, it, it, it recognizes the antigen on the tumor? Yes. And how do you then give the CAR T cell back? So in this particular trial, mm -hmm. it's going to be for recurrent GBM. So the idea is we take the primary tumor out, we would stain them for the antigen. Most tumors have this antigen. Mm -hmm. And then with the next surgery, when they take out the recurrent, they would then directly administer the CAR T cell to the tumor. Oh, that's very, yeah. very interesting. Very cool. So, you know, one of the interesting things for me, at least, has been sort of the understanding that there's a, a, a large immune function that's taking place yes. in the brain. Yes. That to me is kind of new science. Mm -hmm. And can you just sort of Talk about the brain as an immune organ? Yeah, absolutely. So the resident immune cells in the brain are these cells called microglia. They're not formal glia because they are immune cells. They're right. only glia in name. And so what these cells do is they do, they, they, they do a lot of things. One key thing that they do in development is they help sculpt these synapses. They will, too many synapses is bad, right? right. So they come in and they phagocytose a lot of these synapses and help refine the circuits that control so they're kind of like a macrophage in the, in the brain. That is exactly what they are. They do oh, that. I knew that from HIV work. <laughs> <I know> that's, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. So they do that, and then they also respond to injuries. There's sort of these okay. sentinels that sit around the brain, and whenever there is some kind of injury or a death of another cell, they go in there and they clean the mess up. This is an unbelievably exciting field. I, I, I think right now probably the most important field in all of medicine is understanding brain health and brain tumors oh, yeah. and neurodegeneration. So thank you for taking the time today. It's awesome. Uh, I hope we get a chance to talk to Dr. Ganesh after he gets out of the OR. I hope so too. <laughs> but thank you so much and keep doing that great work and hopefully you'll figure out a cure for glioblastoma. Let's hope. <laughs> okay, Thanks. Great to see Thanks. you. We are here with uh, Dr. Ganesh Rao, the chairman of neurosurgery and unknown for most people, the world's most interesting man. This is true. Did you know that? I thought so too. <laughs> it is true. You know what they say? It's like, well, it's not neurosurgery. Well, it turns out that's what you do. And, correct, and yeah. you do some of the most complicated stuff in the world. And actually, uh, I wanted to ask you about the tumor that you've spent a lot of time uh, in your life studying glioblastoma. Because in my view, and probably everybody else's view, there's no worse outcome or worse tumor to have. So why is that? Can you tell us a little bit about what a glioblastoma is and how it's different from other types of tumors and why it's so hard to treat? So glioblastoma is one of the most challenging tumors to treat. Uh, the survival rates have not changed in decades, despite a lot of effort from a lot of people. Uh, what's makes, what makes this challenging, uh, several reasons. Number one, the, the brain is kind of a, an immune privileged area. Mm -hmm. So immunotherapy has revolutionized other cancer treatments. 
Uh, there are immune cells in the brain. They do, they do get activated. But for whatever reason, glioblastoma is incredibly immunosuppressive. So those activated immune cells, they don't work like they work in the so rest they, of the body. So are they in microglia? Where, 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 are the, where are the activated immune cells? So, so. Micro, so microglia, macrophages, mm -hmm. they get drawn to the glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. And some macrophages, we're used to hearing about them, you know, phagocytosing or killing right, tumor right. cells. But in the brain, it's completely different. They are immunosuppressive. Interesting. So they keep other, other T cells out, other immune cells out. So a lot of cancers are rich with T cells, and we can harness those to attack the tumor cells. I see. But in the brain, they're completely shut out. So what about other metastatic tumors to the brain? Are they similarly? Uh, Great they question. It's actually, actually now immunotherapy has revolutionized metastatic brain cancer. Oh, okay. So we can give immunotherapy systemically. And the, uh, melanoma, for example, actually responds very well to immunotherapy, Is even in the brain. In the brain. In the brain, yes. You know, and then I'm always fascinated by testicular cancer. And I'm more, because I'm more people have brain meds and can be cured completely cured. by... Whatever. It right. must be that the drugs get in and... The drugs response. get in. The, the microenvironment's mm -hmm. very different for immune to, uh, for right, metastatic right. cancers versus... Uh, well, what about... Cancer. So I've also been interested in astrocytomas. What, what, there's a supporting cell, but maybe not. Maybe maybe very interesting for my yeah, previous yeah. discussions. Yeah, so the, the, before, I would say, probably 2008, gliomas were a monolith. Basically, mm -hmm. they all viewed the same way, right, and, right. and we thought it's all the same cancer. Now it turns out these are multiple different types of cancers. So glioblastoma by itself, when I get a path report now, right. it used to just say a couple of things, glioblastoma. Right. Now I probably get seven or eight things that are, define the molecular characteristics. I see. And then we sequence all of these. So we will get a, a litany of different genetic um, programs. So, that so that's really, I didn't know that. So uh, in, if you sequence uh, most solid tumors, what you find is multiple different mutations. Is it the same in glioblastoma? Is it, and I thought astrocytoma tends to have one genetic or two genetic markers. Right. So taking a step back, yeah. now we define uh, gliomas by a very early um, kind of event, we think. And that's the mutation of what's called the isocitrate dehydrogenase gene. Okay. So if you remember your biochemistry, this is part of citric acid cycle. I'm sure you do. <laughs> and, uh, the, the tumors that are mutated are completely different than the wild type, and it turns out the mutated tumors are more common in younger people. They actually tend to have a better prognosis. So when you hear about a mutation, you right. think, oh, this must be bad. It turns out those are actually better prognostically, huh. and we can target those. There's a new drug that just came out that targets that mutation that's been revolutionary. It's the first new drug for gliomas in 25 years. Oh, that's fascinating. The other, the wild type tumors tend to be the glioblastomas, and they tend to do worse. And so that's a very important first kind of... Um, uh, diagnostic or prognostic criteria that we get in a PATH report and with a list of other ones now that are coming out that aren't necessarily actionable. Some of them are, but many right. of them are prognostic. So because of the different biochemical signature, can you actually tell normal tissue from tumor tissue that way, or is it just so obviously morphologically it's easy to No, it's not, it's not obvious radiographically. It's not obvious in the, tu in the surgery, um, but we are using, there are new techniques that use things like MR spectroscopy and other things. Uh, the new pen that we have, the, the spec. There actually is a spec pen or, or yeah. uses Raman spectroscopy that yeah. can actually pick up the mutation intraoperatively. Um, uh, so these things are coming online uh, yeah, that are more cool. available. So it must be incredibly difficult um, most of my world is you have an animal model to test them. Are there animal models, and how do you approach uh, sort of understanding how to treat and glue? There are lots of animal models now. Mm -hmm. In fact, my lab uses genetically engineered models that uh, where the tumor arises in the normal kind of microenvironment of the brain. So historically, we've had to use cell lines where we have to right. suppress the immune system or use immune, immune comp uh, you know, incompetent mice. Right. Now we've got access to several models that are that really recapitulate what happens. So um, you put the same mutation, or is it? A we can we can do different mutations. Oh, wow. So, um, for example, NF1, P10, mm -hmm, P53. Mm -hmm. If we can knock all of those out, we can get a tumor to form in a mouse. Wow. Uh, my uh, partner in crime, so to speak, so to speak, Ben Denine and I yeah. have several models together that we use that have been really, I would say, revolutionary in our ability. And to how good are those things. models at developing therapeutics that can be applied to humans? Yeah, well, we've cured a lot of mice, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, that's the, You're going to get a, a national award from the mice. I know, I know. I mean, if we could, if, if it translated to people, we yeah. would, you know, be so happy. But uh, I think it's really critical to know that the the mouse models are useful to us because. Um, number one, this is a cancer that, you know, you don't have a lot of time. We right, have right. to, like, we have to come up with therapies and treatments quickly for people. Like, just so people know, like, what is, I mean, you say not a lot of time. 
it's the one year survival is which has not changed significantly yeah. right survival for a glioblastoma um, is about 12 to 15 months yeah. and we can we can improve that with you know surgery right, tends right. to make a big difference if you can get a, a complete resection it's not keep, not possible in all patients um, and some people have you know, genetic makeup right. that makes them a little bit more responsive to treatment, um, but generally the survival rates haven't yeah. changed, changed dramatically. And the five-year survival two percent. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's terrible. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So, is there anything? <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, I'm depressed now. Now, is there is there anything on the horizon that you think is absolutely? Be? So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, tell us yeah, what it so, is. So, um, lots of new things that are coming out. Uh, new targeted therapies mm -hmm. that are coming out. I mentioned um, an IDH1 inhibitor that's right. being used for IDH mutant tumors. Uh, that's been revolutionary. We're seeing incredible survival really? rates with that, um, but that's you know a subset, right? Small, so if you look at group, if you yeah. look at glioblastoma, the IDH wild type ones, the really bad actors, what's coming out? Well, we've seen some really strong signals with CAR T cells. Okay. So a couple of groups have published um, some pretty remarkable responses with that. And again, it's not in everybody. Yeah. But um, we How actually how are those have, given? Is it peripheral, or do you have to do intrathecal? Great question. In so different. Giving it systemically doesn't seem to have an effect. Okay. Um, there are different groups that are doing it either intrathecally, so in the ventricle, right. in the spinal fluid. We have a trial spinning up now with a homegrown CAR T cell okay. that um, actually was identified, uh, the target was identified in Dr. Deneen's lab a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So from bench to bedside, it's happening. And we're going to give that in the cavities. So we will I actually re remove a tumor and then put the put CAR T cells directly in. Yeah. Well, that, you know, it, it needs something. It needs something. It needs something, and I think we're probably better. You, you, and your team are as positioned as well as anyone to try and. Well, I would say, you know, I, I think you know we have an unbelievably rich environment here. Yeah. We have great scientists here. We have a clinical trial infrastructure that's fantastic. Right. Expertise that you know can take these things from the lab to the hospital, and, and Wh I'm which is for why you're at Baylor College of Medicine. And I'm going to end there because that was an incredibly positive statement <laughs> that you rarely hear. <laughs> But anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited about we, what you and uh, Dr. Deneen are doing, and uh, we all are hoping for you. We all want the best. So thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Appreciate thank your you. support. <laughs> Wasn't that really interesting? I, I love to hear Drs. Deneen and Rao uh, speak about their, their work. It's really fascinating. But I want to end today with a couple of shout outs. First of all, welcoming the class of uh, health professional students 2027 for our PA students or physician assistant in orthotics and prosthetics program in the School of Health Professions. They started classes this week, so happy, happy to have you and good luck. Uh, also, the presentation of the 2025 DeBakey Research Awards will be held uh, this uh, Tuesday, June 24th in M112 from 2 to 4 p.m. A live stream is av available and uh, Janet, if you want to come visit, and participate in the Dubai Awards, you're welcome to do so. And finally, congratulations to Zia Rahman, a senior at Dubai High School for Health Professions, whose artwork was chosen as the Board of Directors pick in the 27th Annual Student Art Contest by Performing Arts Houston. It is beautiful work, and I will show you, we'll show you what it is. Anyway, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>